Okay, welcome everyone um, to today's webinar, Wellness web Webinar. Um, I'm Brittany Vince. I'm a counselor with student wellness um, at McMaster University. And today I'm going to be talking about finding inner calm. So managing stress amidst this pandemic, um, COVID-19. And as I said, I'm normally working as a one-to-one -one counselor with students at the university. I also um, will run groups um, of varying topics and workshops for our students. And I also work um, within Indigenous student services, although this webinar is through Indigenous, or sorry, through um, Student Wellness um, Center. So welcome and thank you for joining us. So let's get right into it. So the first thing I just want to say is that today's webinar is for information purposes only. And so it's by no means a substitute for psychotherapy or mental health care. Um, so if you're concerned about your mental health or well-being in any sort of way, please consult with your healthcare provider. So what are we going to focus on today? Um, we're going to understand common responses to the current COVID-19 pandemic and learn some strategies that can assist you to feel more calm and content during this time. And then at the end, we will leave some time for some questions and some answers. And so I ask people to um, save their questions for the very end, and you can use the Q&A function, which can be found at the um, bottom of your screen there. And we will take those questions at the end, like I said. Okay, so um, COVID-19, what are some common emotional reactions to this really abnormal time? Well, I have separated the emotional reactions into three kind of categories. Um, one being anxiety and fear, so often people are feeling concerned that you or your loved one may contract the virus, which is understandable. This is a very real and serious thing um, that's going on. So it makes sense that we might feel a bit anxious or scared of that. Um, there's also concern about um, scarcity of resources, meeting basic needs. Um, and there could be other fears or anxieties that are present there as well. Um, in terms of grief and depression, so grieving the loss is associated with the pandemic. So loss can mean a, a lot of different things. So oftentimes we think of grief with death. And of course, that can be very real for a lot of people during this time. Um, there's also loss of other sorts of things such as normalcy, income, loss of wellness. Maybe we're grieving the loss of special events or plans that we had. And um, those grief reactions are very real as well. So if you know someone that was planning, say for instance, a wedding or, you know, our grad, our convocation that had to be postponed at the university. Um, so things like that are, are milestones and it makes sense that we would grieve, um, you know, those events during this time. And then there's low mood associated with lack of connection with others, not having things to look forward to. So Boredom is very real and it can absolutely impact our mood. And fatigue from holding high levels of stress or anxiety. So believe it or not, we can actually go from being really anxious, really stressed, and then go to the like kind of opposite reaction, I guess, and feel really low after just holding that amount of stress in our bodies for so long. We can only um, tolerate that sort of stress for a certain period of time before we then maybe crash, as they might say, or, or start to shut down. Anger, frustration, and irritability. So there could be anger about the restrictions or maybe people who are not complying with public health directives, um, being uncertain of how long this will go on for. And it can also just be another expression of anxiety or fear. So sometimes the people in our lives that are expressing irritability and frustration could actually be really scared and really anxious. And so we do commonly see irritability as a sign of anxiety, actually. What else might you notice? Um, so some things that I've kind of tallied um, through my conversations with people, both personally and professionally, are things such as excessive checking behaviors. So that's when someone feels that they always have to check something. So things like checking the news, being really hyper aware and checking symptoms that might even not even be there, right? People are kind of really checking things like temperature all the time. Do I have a cough? What do I notice? Do I have a little tickle in my throat? But um, to an extreme degree, 
social media might be overly um, checked and um, looked into. Hoarding behaviors, we've seen these and they've been all over the news. So the people that are hoarding things like toilet paper or food, um, cleaning products, overeating or undereating, increased conflict with loved ones, difficulty sleeping, um, so lack of sleep or oversleep, um, use of substances to cope, increased difficulty managing emotions or emotional ups and downs, a general feeling that you either can't calm down or are shutting down, and an excessive worry and rumination about the topic. So maybe this is something you're thinking about a lot. So what do we do about these things? What can we do to help ourselves during such a difficult and novel time? I, I know I've never experienced anything like this in my life, and I'm sure most of you have not either. Um, so what I did is I collected um, strategies um, that have been found to be helpful with the clients that I'm working with, as well as what I've been doing myself, um, that are rooted in evidence-based practices to share with you today. So we'll have to be quick because I do want to get through all of them. And as I said, I want to leave some time for some questions at the end. So the first um, tool that I'm going to talk about is self-awareness. And um, as simple as it sounds, a lot of us are not very self-aware. We can go through an entire day focusing on what we need to do, but not how we're feeling or not how we're reacting. We're not aware of how we're thinking. <laughs> so we can go through an entire day and not even be aware of these things. So I um, put up a um, graphic of the five factors, which is something that is used in CBT. I like this in place of the CBT triangle, so cognitive behavioral therapy, I guess I should explain that. That's what I mean by CBT. And so um, the CBT triangle is great. I like the five factor model. I think it's a bit more complete. Um, so when we're looking at the five factors, we're looking at five factors to your experience. So the first one being situation or the environmental stimuli, things that are going on outside of us. So situation might be the pandemic, or it could even be the trigger of the day. Maybe, you know, you have a toddler that you're trying to manage while you're working from home, or who knows what it could be, but a situation stressor trigger. And then we have a thought process. We have something, we are always telling ourselves a story about what's going on. So even when we think that we are not telling ourselves a story about what's going on, we are. So there's always a thought process there. And then we obviously have our emotional reactions. We have physical sensations that actually go alongside our emotions. So those are things like temperature, heart rate, breathing, um, tension, um, energy levels, and then we have behavior. So these are things that we do or don't do that people can actually see. So perhaps I, um, I don't know, avoided the test that made me feel really scared and that could technically be a behavioral observation. So we can be self-aware by just noticing these factors within ourselves. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? And how is this impacting my, um, my behaviors or how I'm reacting to the current situation? Okay. So in order to just practice, I thought we could do a little experiential activity. I'm really big on experiential things in my groups. I think it's the best way to learn. Um, so I'd like everyone to take a moment um, to get comfortable in their chairs or in whatever space that you're currently in. And if you're comfortable, just closing your eyes, taking a moment to just check in with your breathing, allowing it to be however it is today, just knowing that there isn't a right or wrong way to breathe. Maybe our, our breathing is a bit more shallow today. Maybe it's a bit deeper. And once you're noticing your breath, I'd like you to scan your body, just checking in with your emotions and your body sensations. Noticing what's there for you. Is there any areas of tension? Anything that you're holding? 
Are there any intrusive thoughts that are pulling you away from this practice? And if so, can we approach those thoughts non-judgmentally, just noticing that they're there, but they're not bad, they're okay, we just need to let go of them for now, and bring ourselves back to our breath and our body. Perhaps sending breath to those areas that you find have more tension. Seeing if you're able to relax those areas a little bit more. And once you feel like you've done a great thorough check-in of your emotions, your body, any thoughts, I'd like you to slowly make yourself aware of your surroundings and come back into the room. Slowly opening your eyes, moving your body a little bit. And so when we practice a body scan exercise, um, what we're really, what the goal is, is just self-awareness, um, being aware of how we're feeling and trying not to make ourselves feel a different way because sometimes people will defensively kind of say, no, I, I'm doing great, everything's fine. And we have to remember that that in itself is a coping mechanism. It's really important to be authentic and to be really honest with how we're feeling. So that way we know what to do with our emotions and we know how to maybe take care of them if we can at least understand what's there for us. So I encourage you to do this every day. Just check in with yourself. And if you have little ones at home, you can also encourage them to, to do the same. The second skill is self-compassion. And if you're really interested in this topic, Kristen Neff, who's a psychologist, um, this is a lot of her work. Um, so self-compassion entails being warm and understanding. Sorry, I'm just gonna move my little camera out of the way here. Toward ourselves when we suffer, fail, or feel inadequate, rather than ignoring our pain or flagellating ourselves with self-criticism. So you wanna be self-compassionate in the same way that you're compassionate towards other people. So there's three elements, self-kindness instead of self-judgment, common humanity instead of isolation, and mindfulness over, over identification. So how do we apply self-compassion to this pandemic? Well, I've seen a lot of things on social media of all the things we should be doing, you know, all the people that are saying, you know, this is a chance to um, do some self-development, um, clean your whole entire house, be incredibly productive, or other people saying you should be doing this instead. Self-compassion -compa suggests that we are being compassionate about whatever our reactions are and our emotions are during this time. So it's trying not to buy into the shoulds that might be out there and just understanding that there's no right or wrong way to cope with a pandemic. There's no manual for this, or at least I don't think there is. Um, <laughs> and so really just trying to lead with self-compassion and whatever is there for you, it's okay. So as much as I'm going to share some more strategies or suggestions that might be seen as healthy habits or things that you can do, I want you to always come back to self-compassion. So if you're not able to do some of these things, if they're really difficult, that's okay. And the best thing that we can do is be our own best friend, be self-compassionate self towards ourselves, be compassionate towards others um, as we move through this. So, um, and as it applies to the three elements, so self-kindness, obviously, I think that's a little bit self-explanatory. So we wanna be kind to ourselves instead of judging ourselves. So even when we did the body scan, say if there is um, a negative emotion there for you today. Um, maybe you don't even label it as negative. Maybe you say there's this emotion here for me today, but I'm not gonna judge myself because that's okay and I'm a human being and it's normal to feel how I'm feeling, especially given these circumstances. Common humanity, this is a great one to apply to the pandemic because all of us are going through this together. Um, I don't want to um, discount the fact that there are people that are having more difficulty right now, just given um, different life experiences, different, um, you know, people have more privilege sometimes than others. Um, and so obviously this impacts people on varying levels. But as a society, we are all experiencing this pandemic and this major change together. 
So self-compassion would say like, you know, this is understandable. Like this is something that lots of people are experiencing. I'm not alone in this. It's okay. And mindfulness over versus over identification, that is our ability to observe and notice what's there for us when it comes to suffering, when it comes to difficulty versus over identifying and becoming enmeshed in that feeling, if that makes sense. So I want you to think of kind of observing what you're experiencing, right? Being curious, saying, hmm, I wonder what's there for me today. And how can I be non-judgmental about whatever is there instead of being fully um, wrapped into it? So for instance, if we're being self-compassionate towards anger, we can observe it and notice it and maybe take care of it. But maybe if we're not over-identifying, we don't feel fully pulled into, you know, um, a reaction out of anger that we might later regret. So there's a difference between being mindful and observing something and being fully pulled into it without any sort of awareness. Um, and as I say here, instead of judging my responses to this pandemic, how can I understand my responses and just be more accepting? The third one um, is pretty um, self-explanatory, healthy routines and basic needs. So when we are taken out of our norm, the best way to kind of feel safe and have a sense of security is to try to have as much normalcy as possible and have some sort of routine. Why do we put structure and routine in place? Well, it helps us to feel less anxious and more safe. Um, and it also helps us to know what to expect, right? So if we don't know what to expect out there right now, how can we um, establish some sort of routine so we know that we have some sort of consistency at least where we have some control? So trying to stick to some sort of flow to your day. For those of you that may be off work right now, that doesn't have to be rigid. It can be something like I generally wake up around this time. I'm gonna kind of have a morning routine and a breakfast and meal kind of um, routine set out. Maybe I do a bit of activity in the afternoon. So having kind of a flow to your day. Sleep-wake cycles, I could do a whole other webinar on, on sleep. <laughs> and how it's being impacted right now, but trying to go to bed around the same time every evening and trying to wake up around the same time every morning. Um, lots of students, as I think you can probably imagine, are really struggling with this right now. I have lots of students who are kind of almost doing the opposite of what I just said and are kind of sleeping throughout the day. So we really need to um, try to keep those sleep-wake cycles intact as much as we can. Uh, morning and bedtime routines, as I said, meal times and balanced intuitive eating. So a lot of people are talking a lot about worry about weight gain right now. Um, you know, I am very eating disorder informed as well as a practitioner. And so I am very big on just noticing what your body needs, listening to your body. Um, if you're feeling hungry, eat. <laughs> um, if you're feeling full, um, that's usually a time to stop and noticing um, what kind of nutrients your body needs. Um, so if we're being intuitive with our eating, we shouldn't be overeating and we also shouldn't be under eating. And we should be doing that once again from a place of self-compassion. Um, personal hygiene, of course, right? We're at home all, all the time, but it's amazing how much a shower and just, you know, maybe doing your hair and getting dressed can, can do for you and your mood and your motivation and also trying to get some physical activity in there. So being able to move your body in some sort of way that day um, can really help with, once again, mitigating stress and having a good mood. So mindfulness, we kind of already talked about this, um, but being mindful is, is more of a how than a what. Like, so people usually think of mindfulness as like yoga, meditation, but you can actually be mindful doing pretty much anything. Um, so it's being as present as you possibly can be um, without judgment and being just aware of what's going on either around you or internally. So the body scan that we just did was a example, excuse me, was an example of an internal mindfulness activity. So being mindful of the emotions and the sensations and whatever else is there for you internally. We can be externally mindful. So for those of you who say I have no time to do mindfulness, technically we could wash our dishes mindfully. We could notice the heat of the water. 
we could notice um, the smell of the dish soap, we could notice how it feels on our hands, uh, maybe the bubbles, um, and trying to do so slowly and being fully present there washing that dish. So technically, that's mindfulness as well. Um, so you want to turn your attention to the present moment, and it uh, allows you to feel more engaged with what you're doing. And it also allows you to take a break from worrying about the future, dreading or, you know, ruminating about the past or, you know, overthinking the past and just being fully where your feet are planted. So allowing yourself to be fully there. And the self-isolation stuff, it's very tough, but the one thing that we can strengthen right now is how to be more present and mindful where we currently are. Because we can't really plan too far in advance right now, or, or at least I know in my role, it's kind of up in the air. Um, and um, we can't, you know, it's not helpful to overthink the past. So how can we be more present? How can we be more engaged in what we're doing? How can we be more engaged with the loved ones that we might have around us? Um, how can we be more mindful even towards, say, your pets, if you have pets at home? Um, and mindfulness is, um, does have empirical evidence. So we do know it is helpful for anxiety and depression and general stress. Um, there are lots of um, specific findings around mindfulness. And if you're interested in that, um, you can definitely find those in the abstracts. Um, there is um, a specific breakdown of the benefits on the American Psychological Association website. Um, so yeah, mindfulness is great. And yes, meditation and yoga and all those things are also mindful. But once again, being mindful, just being present as much as you can, non-judgmentally, and being aware. And doing so intentionally, right? So being like, okay, I'm going to try to be fully here right now. I'm going to put down my phone and I'm going to have this conversation with I don't know, my partner, or I'm going to, um, you know, take a look at the sun outside. Um, I'm going to be fully um, aware of how I'm feeling today. So all of those things can be seen as mindful. Practicing gratitude. I know sometimes this is um, harder to do than it is to say, um, especially right now, when we feel like a lot of the things that we normally love and do have a lot of gratitude for maybe are not um, accessible to us or we can't do. Um, so as we talked about, being present allows us to notice things. And then it also should allow us to notice things that we appreciate, both great and small. So given that life has slowed down and has become maybe a bit more simple, I'm not saying easier, but more simple, um, maybe this is a time where we can start to notice what we do appreciate around us, both great and small. So I know for me, I've reflected a lot on um, how fortunate I am to, you know, have a safe housing environment and to feel safe inside and to um, have a role that I'm able to adapt to online. Um, you know, thankful for my loved ones, thankful for my, um, my dog who brings a lot of joy to my life. So being able to just stop for a moment and just reflect on the things that you're thankful for. And it could even be something like, I'm so thankful for, you know, this specific meal that I'm having, or I'm so thankful for, I don't know, it could be something so small all the way to something so great in your life. Um, and the other thing that I've been kind of talking to people about is just noticing um, what some of the perks may be about this novel time. And I say that very carefully. I don't want to, um, you know, minimize or make light of what is a really difficult and hard time for many people right now. So obviously this is impacting people's health. Obviously people have um, passed away from COVID. Um, our healthcare providers, our essential workers, um, this is, and, and people who do struggle with mental health, even before the pandemic um, as well. And so I'm very aware of all of that. That being said, we can hold space and empathy for people, for ourselves, um, while also being thankful for what we might be able to delve more into during this time. So maybe for some people that's spending more time with their family, 
maybe that's being able to relax a little bit more. Um, maybe that's something else. So just really thinking of, is there anything about this time that once everything is said and done and we're back to our normal that I might miss a little bit or I might reminisce on and say, you know what, I actually learned something for that or from that or I'm actually really appreciative about my experience of having that. Um, and it's okay to give yourself permission to be grateful. As I said, sometimes people, because this is generally a really devastating event, world event, we almost feel, might feel bad about being grateful, but please don't. As I said, we can hold um, empathy and compassion and um, be able to hold space for all of those difficult emotions that are present right now, while also being um, thankful for what we can be thankful for. Um, you can even ask yourself, what messages am I sending myself that prevent me from being comfortable to express gratitude? So that could be a little reflection activity if this is difficult to do right now. Okay, and I think I already talked about the last point there, so we'll move on. This one I think is really powerful and simple. Um, so letting go of what you cannot control, and I'm sure many of you have seen um, these sorts of graphics online at this point. Um, so the circle of control is something that I, you know, that therapists use often um, before the pandemic. So being able to notice what's within your circle of control and what's not within your circle of control. And just to make it super simple for you, the things that are within your circle of control are um, things that you do, your own emotions, we have to be responsible for our own emotions, regardless of what the triggers were, um, our own thoughts, those sorts of things. That's basically it. We really can't control a lot else. We can maybe um, try to influence other people in a good way, support other people in a good way, but when it comes down to it, we cannot control others or bigger, or bigger things going on. So, we can't control whether other people are social distancing. Well, I guess you could technically call the hotline if you're concerned about um, someone who's not listening to the um, directives, but we can't really control others, obviously. We can't control, it says here, the amount of toilet paper at the store, how long this will last, how others react, things like that. So giving yourself full permission to kind of let go is as difficult as that sounds, but to kind of sort out what is yours to take care of right now and what can you just let go of. And right now it's for you to take, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your thoughts, feelings, be really mindful about your actions. If you have little ones or other people that you care for at home, obviously they would be um, maybe included. Um, but trying not to ruminate or overthink um, about things that are not within our control. We have to kind of allow things to flow as they may and really just do our part. So stimulus control. Um, so this is setting limits and boundaries when it comes to things that are going to increase your stress levels and your anxiety around COVID. So I found it's been really helpful to be really, um, really, really cognizant about how much news you're watching, how much you're engaging with social media, um, how much you choose to engage in the topic when speaking to a loved one, or how are you speaking about it? Does it feel like a fear-mongering conversation where you just notice your heart starts to beat faster and you're getting more tense as the conversation goes on? We have to be really aware of these things. It doesn't mean that we don't know that this is happening around us. It just means that we're making an active choice about how much attention we are willing to put towards specific information. Um, a rule that I've set for myself, for example, is, you know, unless it's information that is going to impact how I act or behave, or it's going to change something in my life, um, I don't really need to know that information. I'm very aware that, like, for instance, a couple weeks ago when, like, the cases kept going up, 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 I was very aware that was likely happening, um, but I didn't feel like it was helpful to turn on the news and to be reminded of that every single day. Um, if it was something like benefits that I could should be aware of for 
self, family, or clients, yes, I should know that information. Um, if it was legislation or directives, um, yeah, would want to know that as well. And now they're starting to roll out um, plans going forward, which is also great information to know. So just being aware of kind of how much you are engaging in um, this topic, trying actively to talk about other things. <laughs> I know it's kind of hard to sometimes, but um, trying to do that, trying to speak to loved ones or other people about other topics besides coronavirus. Um, and critically thinking about the credibility of the source what the information actually is versus your interpretation. Once again, the five factors, we all have thoughts, we all have perceptions. Um, we might all get one piece of information and, you know, one person thinks that that means this and another person might interpret that as something completely different. So if you're very careful and actually read the information as it is, I know that, um, at one point, some projections were put forward and I had a client say, this means that I'm going to be alone in my house for two years. And then we had to take out the information together and maybe look at that and what it actually said. And it didn't actually say that particularly. So I'm um, being really critical of using those critical thinking skills um, when you're engaging with media and the sources of or where we're getting our information. How do they know what they know? Um, this one, challenging unhelpful thinking and looking for positive information. So this is a CBT skill. Um, once again, cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm going to have to be pretty quick with this because I'm just really mindful of time. And I, I know I tend to like to talk, so I'm just going to have to move through a little bit quicker. Um, so challenging unhelpful thinking. So the first step, like I said, is awareness. So if you're aware of what you're thinking, then it becomes easier to be aware of worries or negative thoughts specifically. So if you have a negative thought and it's impacting your emotions, just, just given that web I showed you the five factor model, you can see that our thoughts are directly connected to our emotions. Um, you have to sometimes challenge that thought. We can't just take it as it is and say like, oh no, like this is, this is a fact. Our thoughts are not facts. Our thoughts are perceptions and interpretations. Okay, so you can ask yourself some of these questions. Is this 100% true? Am I jumping to conclusions or trying to predict the future? I know a lot of us have been trying to do that. Um, am I reasoning out of emotion? Am I really stressed or really irritable today? And maybe I'm coming from that perspective. Am I overgeneralizing an idea based on a small piece of information? One person said this this one time, so it means that this is gonna happen. Or I noticed this one little piece of information or evidence over here, so that must mean this. So kind of getting away from ourselves and overgeneralizing an idea. Does this thought serve me? So even if all of the rest you get through the other questions, you can even ask yourself, does this thought serve me? Is it helpful, right? Is it helpful to think that, you know, we're going to be doing this, this, and this in two years, like my one client said, right? Um, so asking yourselves what this thought does to your emotional experience, those physical sensations we talked about, and does it actually help me in any way? And then the other thing that we can do alongside challenging those negative thoughts, we can start to notice more positive information. So when a threat is happening around us, um, our brain has a specific um, way of managing threat, okay? So we are going to be likely to notice negative information. It makes sense. We're trying to protect ourselves, right? So on an evolutionary level, we're trying to notice threats that are around us, and we're trying to prevent ourselves from being harmed in any sort of way. So it can be really difficult to put a different filter on so that way we are able to also see positive information. Or maybe we can think of it as putting a different pair of glasses on that are rose colored and trying to, to notice positive information. So also noticing things that help you to feel more positive or more hopeful. This could be positive information about the actual virus. I know there's been more hopeful information coming out recently about this. Um, it could be something that inspired you. So there's been a lot of really beautiful stories about community care, caring for one another, um, 
you know, various um, things going on in the community during all of this that can help to inspire you or help you to feel more positive? Um, and what information do I know that challenges my negative thoughts, right? So being able to, once again, be critical about those thoughts that make you feel stressed, anxious, um, having a low mood, those sorts of things, while also being a little bit more aware and turning your attention a bit more to the hopeful or positive information, which isn't easy. We have to be really, really intentional about it. If you're looking for more information on how to challenge thinking, um, Mind Over Mood is a CBT manual. It's one of the best selling therapy manuals that's out there. And it's by Greenberger and Podesky. Um, it's widely sold, it's easy to find, and there's more skills um, within that manual um, about challenging unhelpful thinking. This one's pretty self-explanatory, and I know a lot of people have been talking about this, the importance of staying connected during this time. So as human beings, we are primed for connection um, from birth on, so we are social beings. Um, all of us obviously have very varying social needs, um, but it's super important that we stay connected to loved ones. Um, so obviously phone, text, video calls, creative means of celebrating special events. I've seen lots of really awesome um, creative um, ways of celebrating from, you know, drive-bys with balloons on the car to kind of um, standing at the sidewalk and singing happy birthday. Um, so trying to be creative and using this as a time to not, not connect, but just connect in very different ways. Um, the other piece I just want to mention this, uh, mention here about this um, is, you know, having boundaries with the loved ones that you are living with. So um, there's definitely been a lot more conflict um, throughout all of this. We're not having boundaries or maybe the space that we normally would get with our loved ones. So it's important to be okay with having boundaries and not see it as a personal thing. Um, you know, there might be times where you spend time together and times where you spend time apart if you're able to. Um, so I know one of my coworkers is doing a webinar, I believe, on healthy relationships coming up. So stay tuned for that one. She'll expand maybe more on that. Um, but alongside being connected, we also need to have boundaries, especially the people that we're maybe stuck in the house with for a prolonged period of time. And last but certainly not least, I really encourage everyone to get outside as much as you're able to. I know not everyone maybe has access to green space. Um, I know there's lots of directives in place. Um, hopefully those start to be lifted eventually. I know that there's some plans um, moving forward. So um, stay tuned um, in terms of trails and nature spaces. But there's healing benefits to nature. Um, so sun, fresh air, wind, trees are all not, they're not canceled. So you know, if you're able to even open a window, um, you know, especially when it's sunny outside, that can really help our mood. We know that. There's a reason why during winter months when the sky is gray and it's cold outside that people tend to have lower moods or seasonal affective disorder, right? So we need to be aware of the fact that we do have access to outside still. Of course, it's changed. We have to be really mindful of, um, what we are allowed to do, but trying to get out for that walk or trying to go sit outside um, can be incredibly helpful um, to your mood and to your overall well-being. Okay, so those are my 10 um, quick practical tools. Um, and once again, coming right back to even with all of that, just a reminder about self-compassion, which was the second tool. So Regardless of everything that I've said, just do what you can do and be understanding towards yourself, be compassionate towards yourself. This is a really odd time and there's no right or wrong way to deal with any of this. So with that, um, I've also put some resources here that you might find helpful. Um, so Calm and Headspace are mindfulness or meditation apps. Um, Mindshift CBT has some CBT skills. And Down Dog is a yoga app, but they also have other movement or physical activity related um, apps, such as Seven Minute Workout. And I believe that they are free, I think, until the beginning of June. So um, you can download those 
um, apps, if those are helpful to you. Also, mindful.org has some COVID specific resources for mental well being. I really love um, Kristen Neff's website um, for self compassion, so selfcompassion.org. Um, I mentioned the Mind Over Mood workbook, and there's also the Mental Health Commission website, um, so COVID specific reading and resources related to your mental well being. Okay, and with that, we're going to take some questions. Um, let's see how much time we have here. We have a good amount of time, I think, to take some questions. So I'm just going to stop sharing the PowerPoint at this time. So just had a comment. Thank you, very helpful. Awesome, great. I'm glad that some of this information can be helpful to you. Um, great. Can we get a copy of your slides? Sure, I can't see why not. Um, I can maybe forward those to um, someone at the Alumni Association and maybe they can be the point of contact and send those out um, if they're okay with it and then I have no issues. Yeah. How much mindfulness a day would you recommend? Well, the other thing is mindfulness is a skill. Um, so mindfulness takes time. Um, so I don't know if anyone's heard of neuroplasticity or neuropathways, but it takes time to strengthen our ability to be present and to just have kind of like a quiet mind, a quiet, quiet, present mind. So you almost might notice that you have to try it just for a short period of time and then you can kind of, um, do it for longer. Um, based on how much you feel like you can tolerate. It can be really difficult. It's a practice, right? So it's not really like you do it perfectly. It's like, you know, you try it, um, it has benefits, and as you keep going along, it becomes a little bit easier. So I'm not gonna give you a specific amount of um, minutes or, or whatever, um, but maybe just trying to make something mindful within your day, whether it's a meditation or like I said, a mindful activity. You could do your laundry mindfully, technically. So I would just say practicing it every day as much as you feel comfortable and you can um, expand upon it as you feel you get more um, well versed at it, I guess. Um, can you show the list of resources on your slides again? Um, sure, I can do that maybe at the very end here. Um, awesome. Okay, um, so we have another one. As an RN, I am working more than ever before and face different stress than those required to work from home or who are unemployed. I'm finding that I'm resentful of people who are not in the workforce, especially people who are not following the current rules. Um, it's to the point where that I'm feeling very angry and this is exhausting. Any suggestions? Well, first of all, thank you for your work and for being a healthcare provider and, and putting yourself out there and keeping us all um, cared for and safe. Um, I wanna just normalize your experience and your emotions. I think that that's a really normal emotional um, response to have, you know, to see people not listening and to be, you know, choosing to go, well, not choosing, but going into work, choosing to help those um, who are not well and putting yourself in that position. So it makes sense that you are feeling that resentment and you're feeling really angry and that it's exhausting. Um, I think that I want to really carefully give you maybe a suggestion just because once again, I am not in the same situation as you. So of course, only you would know um, how that feels and other people in your positions. But I think going back to kind of what you can control, it sounds like you know, you're doing everything you can, not only just as a um, community member, but as a healthcare provider to, um, you know, to battle against this pandemic. So you're doing everything that you can, and we cannot control other people. We cannot control other people's thoughts. Of course, I don't agree with people not following directives either. Um, I think that, um, you know, there's lots of different thoughts I could have about that. Um, so it's understandable. So just remembering what you can control and then what you can't. The other thing I wanna say is that I do believe that there is um, a program and I can maybe share this with the alumni as well if they don't already have access to it, but there is um, 
free psychotherapy that's being offered to healthcare providers pro bono by trained therapists right now. And I know a couple people that are in volunteering in that program. Um, so if it's something that you feel is really pressing for you and it keeps um, that resentment is not really lessening and it's really impacting you, I would suggest that you look into um, that program and maybe getting some one-to-one -one, um, counseling or psychotherapy because it can be helpful. It's, um, and once again, your experience is super normal. I would feel similar to you. Um, so thank you again. And I hope that that's somewhat helpful to you. Um, I'm just going to move on here. If we already had the mental health issues from for a long time and we were not aware of it earlier, and now with the quarantine, is it it, it is aggravating? So how to how can we balance it? So yeah, like if you have um, mental health issues from even before the pandemic, absolutely, you're more predisposed to have a more difficult time right now, especially if there are things like anxiety, depression, um, social anxiety can actually get really bad right now. Like social anxiety right now would almost feel like, oh, this is great. But then when we have to go back to normal it would be a 10 out of 10 because we're not exposing ourselves to kind of social interactions. Um, OCD can be a really, really difficult one right now as well. Um, I think, you know, just continuing to be really self-aware, um, you know, you can start to connect with um, your healthcare provider about your concerns. So you can always call your doctor and let them know that you're concerned about these things and they can start to work with you on a treatment plan. I can't, um, I can't talk about specific um, cases or you know your health specifically of course um, in this webinar but I think it's never a bad time to reach out and I know most healthcare providers are doing telehealth um, so don't think of it as there isn't any help available um, you would probably just do it over the phone or over video with your doctor and lots of therapists are doing um, yeah over the phone or video appointments as well um, sorry, there's, let me just keep going here. Um, dealing with guilt that I'm not helping was called to return to work, but due to anxiety could not. Um, retired uh, nurse of four years um, have tried to volunteer, but no callbacks. Okay, well, I mean, when we're talking about doing what we can and letting go of what we can't, part of that is also the mental health component of it, okay? So resources are not just what we can do physically, it's also what we can do emotionally and mentally, and we all have our own limits and boundaries. It's totally okay that, um, you know, you're experiencing a level of anxiety that doesn't allow you to go back to work, okay? Um, so just knowing that it's okay to make a personal choice about these sorts of things, um, you know, going back into the hospital during this time, especially when you're retired and likely of an older age, um, you know, that that's a risk, right? And we all need to make our own personal choices about how much risk we can take on. So I just want you to know that it's totally okay um, to make your own choices and just to remember that, you know, guilt is something that we have when we have um, made up rules or shoulds for ourselves. So I want you to maybe take a look at what some of those shoulds are that you're, you're um, putting on yourself. Um, do you have any other short exercises I can do when feeling angry, stressed, that is similar to the, the body scan that you shared? So I would definitely download the Calm app um, and Headspace. I believe Headspace might have a fee. Um, at least for the premium version, but either way, they have a ton of different mindfulness meditation um, exercises on there. And there's also other apps. So even if you just go into the app store and typed in meditation or mindfulness, um, you would be able to find lots of different guided um, exercises. Um, so someone's asking about um, whether prayer is helpful and specifically is referring to a kind of Christianity. Definitely, if you're a spiritual person um, and that's some a place that you draw strength from, absolutely, like engaging in that is um, important. And we definitely see that um, those people that do have belief systems of whatever sort, religious, spiritual, maybe it's just strong values or whatever it is for you, engaging in spirituality is definitely a strength and a protective um, factor against mental health. So um, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I live in a small apartment and unfortunately I don't have access to places where I can go for a walk. The self-isolation is starting to take a toll on my stress and anxiety. I notice every noise the neighbors make and it really triggers my stress, not to mention not being able to go to work and all the rest. Can you suggest some specific ways to cope with that anxiety or stress? So yeah, um, that's really difficult. And so um, I just acknowledge that that's, you know, it's hard to be isolated in a small space for a long period of time. And it's normal to some degree to have specific um, mental health difficulties because of that. So I just wanna say that as well. Um, sometimes when we're feeling irritable or anxious about something, we are hyper vigilant. So that means that we are hyper aware of certain things. So that would make sense in terms of noticing noises that the neighbor's making. Maybe they're not that big of noises, but because um, we're aware of them, like maybe once the first time the neighbor makes a noise after that, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm super aware of it now. Um, so, you know, sometimes people find it helpful to have um, like say if you're if you're going to sleep or something like that I know that's been a struggle for some people when neighbors make noises um, if they're living in an apartment building when say they're trying to go to sleep or relax maybe having a fan or a white noise machine can be really helpful um, having some sort of background noise and once again trying to turn your attention to something different aside from the noise which is really hard to do but trying to maybe turn your attention inward maybe focusing on your breathing maybe focusing on a sense, right? So, you know, something that you can see in your apartment, smell, touch, taste, um, maybe a different thing that you can hear that's not um, so stress inducing. Um, trying to engage in things in your apartment that help you to feel more calm and content. And maybe that is more meditation or you know, engaging in things that help to increase positive emotions. So even like a funny movie, um, something that's going to counteract those emotions of stress and anxiety. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna say for that one. Although, you know, if I had many hours, I'm sure there's lots of different things, other things I could share more in depth. Um, so CBTI Coach is a free app that is guided activities, yes. I love CBTI. Um, so CBTI is a CBT app for insomnia. Um, it's great if you're having difficulty with sleep right now, and it also has some guided activities. It even gives you a little assessment of your sleep and why you might not be sleeping. So that's another great um, resource. What tips, exercises would you suggest to help children and youth identify and express their feelings about COVID-19 if you notice a change in their behavior? Um, awesome question. I actually, I don't work with kids anymore, but I actually used to in my last position. There are some really great books that you can get that talk about feelings and emotions for kids. Um, so there's so many um, that to choose from, but even if you just go to the Indigo website or Amazon or wherever else you normally would get your books and putting in um, feelings or emotions, lots will pop up. Um, I think that's a really great way of um, starting to talk about emotions and just bringing awareness that everyone has them and that they're okay. You can also do it through play. So if you have a chance to play with your kids, um, especially using things like stuffed animals or dolls or things that kind of mimic, um, you know, beings or people um, being able to maybe introduce feelings during play right? So saying like, oh, like this toy is feeling really sad today because of this. And so just try, starting to, um, I guess, socialize um, kids to the fact that emotions are normal. Um, everyone has them. And I would say socializing them maybe to the simpler ones first if they're younger. So happy, sad, scared, and angry are, um, uh, and, and, you know, disgusted as well are technically like the basic emotions. Um, there's also um, Inside Out, that Disney movie is a really great um, resource if you wanted to watch that with your kids and that talks a lot about emotions. Um, I'm finding the monotony and routine of being stuck at home with family that I love brings down my mood. How do I find a healthy amount of interaction, balance of alone time? Yeah, so each person it's gonna be different because each of us have different social needs. Some of us are a bit more introverted, some, some of us are a bit more extroverted. Um, so we're having to balance kind of our family members' needs or our loved ones' needs or whoever we're living with 
um, with our own. So I think being really aware of when you're starting to get irritable or anxious, um, that's a sign that maybe you've had enough of, had enough interaction for that day. Um, every family has to work out their own, I guess, way of coping. So I'll give you an example. Someone I talked to recently said that they're doing all their meals with their family. And aside from that, are having, they're just having alone time. They're engaging in their own activities. And they think that that's more than enough time. If you think about it, in our normal lives, maybe we wouldn't even be getting, we wouldn't even be getting that, right? So just the fact that even we can eat our meals together is maybe a huge um, increase in um, connection with our family. Don't feel guilty about needing to have those boundaries. I always say that boundaries allow us to have healthy relationships. So technically, boundaries or setting limits actually allow us to continue to have, you know, those loving, um, appreciative relationships with our loved ones. If we don't have boundaries, we start to feel resentful towards people, and that ends up impacting the relationship. So even with our partners or even with our kids, like there has to be some kind of boundaries. Boundaries are different between different types of relationships or depending on the situation. But I think you have to just kind of listen to your um, your emotions and listen to what feels like a good balance for you and then being able to communicate that with your family and that will also have to compromise with what their needs are too so that's what i would say for that okay so i'm just going to show the list of resources on my slides now um, i know that alumni was going to send out some resources as well um, or at least i had requested um, just for resources in terms of where to go from here if you're um, requiring any sort of mental health um, assistance. Um, another, um, like a good stepping stone, if you're not sure where to go, is just really to contact your primary care provider, so your family doctor. Um, if you're concerned about yourself, if you notice that you're having a lot of anxiety, um, you're really having a difficult time coping, um, reaching out to your family doctor and they can normally um, connect you from there. A lot of services are doing things remotely right now, um, so don't think that you can't access um, somebody, um, whether it's a therapist or someone else, um, to, to help you during this time. So that's the other thing I want to say. Of course, this webinar is limited. I had, you know, now we're tops um, <laughs> to kind of um, talk about a few things and answer some questions. So um, I'm sorry if I wasn't able to um, answer some of your questions to the fullest extent that I would like to, um, but just knowing that there is other avenues that you can explore um, to get that help and to feel better. Okay, I'm just going to share it like that. That's fine. Um, okay, so these are the resources. Um, Calm app, um, it's free. And you can also, I believe, download a premium version that costs a bit of money. Um, Headspace and Headspace also has um, kids meditations as well, I believe. Um, at least I was using it when I was practicing with kids um, a couple of years ago. Um, Mindshift CBT and Down Dog. And Down Dog's a really cool app if you're wanting to try yoga because it actually allows you to um, pick how long um, you'd like to practice for, your level, lots of different options there, which is great. And then uh, the other resources I have there. As I said, don't be shy to reach out um, to your healthcare provider if you're feeling like after this webinar you have a bit more self awareness and you feel like you know you might need more help um, than just what you're able to manage on your own. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, mental health is is health and. Um, it's completely normal and it's healthy to reach out and to take care of your mental health. So please do so if you feel that that's something that you need. Um, and other than that, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, keep your eye out for the other wellness webinars that will be um, coming up, including, I believe, healthy relationships, self-care and community care. Um, and you will be, I believe, sent um, a questionnaire about uh, feedback about this um, webinar. And I hope all of you have a gentle and lovely uh, rest of your week. And I hope you all felt that some of this information was helpful for you and that you take good care. Thank you. Bye-bye.